Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, I am Ariana and I interview the broadest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to the channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with our friends. Today, our guest is Rick Gawenda, and he's going to talk about insurance coverage and reimbursement for telehealth during the pandemic and what to expect when the pandemics declare over. Rick is a physical therapist with 30 years of experience and the founder and president of Gawenda Seminars and Consulting. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Rick. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm good, Mariana. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to our uh, conversation. It took a while to fit the schedules, but we are finally here. Yeah. So uh, let's jump right in. So could you tell us a little bit about your career, your story? How did you get to where you are right now? Sure. Uh, well, I'm a physical therapist and this November will be 30 years. So I did graduate PT school back in 1991. Kind of grew up in, in the hospital system, meaning I started uh, as a staff physical therapist in the inpatient acute care unit that moved to the inpatient rehab unit. And then I think many, like many PTs, you kind of get asked, hey, do you want to be a supervisor and things like that? So then I was quote promoted to uh, run the offsite outpatient clinic and oversee high school contracts, things like that. And then when I was doing that, like I think many hospitals, you know, the therapy department asks the financial department how everything is going. And of course, they always say it's going well, going well. And well, we've, next thing you knew, uh, the department was on 100% Medicare uh, medical record review, meaning every Medicare patient we saw, we did not get paid until we submitted the, the notes and had them reviewed. But my director really didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do to get themselves off of this. So I can't remember if I was assigned the task or if I volunteered the task of how to learn how to get us off a 100% Medicare uh, medical record review. So I started, you know, taking courses and things like that. Took about a year and a half, you know, got us off the review and kind of fell in love with that. And then back in 2000, 2001, uh, for us old timers, uh, listservs were becoming very popular. So, you know, I would join some of the different listservs that had rehab professionals on it, therapists on it. And, you know, at first you just kind of pay attention, just kind of read the questions, read people's answers. You don't really reply, it's kind of quote stalking. Well, after doing that for a little bit, you kind of get brave, start answering some of the questions and then you answer more questions. And then, you know, somebody thought, boy, Rick seems smart. You know, they offered me a chance to come speak to the organization. And then I was offered a book deal and it just kind of took off from there. And then I think also my involvement within the American Physical Therapy Association, you know, I stood out with the health policy and administration section, being on the government affairs committee and then the program committee. And then I was fortunate enough to become president of that section for six years. And I think it just kind of snowballed. And I guess the analogy I use is kind of one of the things I was really doing with my website service and all of that, and really on the list serves that. I guess maybe I was a kind of one of the first Twitters or the first Facebook, so to speak, that really started putting out a lot of content out on the website and things like that. And it just took off. But I also think my involvement in the American PT Association, different sections have also helped me. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's the nightmare of every physical therapist, the documentation aspect of things. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think you know, back east, back when I graduated back in 1991, uh, we weren't taught documentation hardly at all. And back in 1991, believe it or not, we did not even have PT evaluation CPT codes back in 91. <laughs> so, you know, I, I know I'm feeding myself. So, and some of the CPT codes, codes we had back then were in 30 minute increments. So things have just changed. I, I do think now you're starting to see more universities uh, have some education at least on the documentation, the coding, the billing, what I'll call it, the basics 101. Um, but I still think it lacks. And obviously, I think they need to kind of get into the 201, the 301 and, and, and teach more of that stuff as well, because 
you know, I know many people think, well, I'm going to work in a hospital, I'm going to work in a nurse home, they'll take care of that for me. I think one thing we all need to remember is it's your license. And, you know, you're the one doing the documentation, you're the one, quote, doing the billing, you're choosing the codes. Uh, your state board's not going to go after the billing person, they're going to come after you. Yeah, that's true. And I was trained in Brazil, so we don't have any of these issues. So for me, it was even more like foreign. I was like, what is this? It's just yeah. so much. It's just so much time uh, to get everything right. So um, I think it's fascinating that you like really love these and create all of this for help all of us. Um, so let's talk about the changes that occurred during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, in regards to telehealth insurance coverage and reimbursement. So what were the changes that you saw? I think, you know, I think COVID, it's sad to say, brought along some positive changes because without it, we'll not see these changes probably. Uh, some of them are going to be permanent, some are going to be temporary. So I guess we'll start with temporary, start with the Medicare program. I'm sure most of your listeners are aware that prior to COVID-19, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists were not recognized telehealth providers, meaning Medicare did not pay for telehealth. Now, the, the good news is a PT and OT and SLP could do a telehealth visit with the Medicare beneficiary and charge them cash since telehealth was statutory non-covered. Due to COVID, on a temporary basis now, until the public health emergency is declared over, the Medicare program does cover uh, outpatient PT, OT, and SLP services delivered via telehealth. And the payment for those services are exactly the same as if the patient came for an in-person visit. Unfortunately, once uh, the public health emergency is declared over, Without congressional action, uh, telehealth would no longer be covered for outpatient PT, OT, and SLP services. So we'll, we have to wait. You know, obviously, we're working with Congress on all of this to, you know, those bills introduced in both the House and the Senate to add PTs as permanent telehealth providers. Um, you know, as I'm sure your listeners know, Congress isn't getting along right now. They haven't gotten along in a while. So uh, we'll have to see, you know, what goes. But I, I do think, that's my opinion, I, I do think somewhere soon, I do believe Congress will add PTs as well as OTs, SLPs as eligible telehealth providers. Uh, you know, the good news is, you know, United Healthcare and Cigna uh, for the private practice therapists for, definitely have added telehealth permanently. Uh, for those two insurance companies. We also know Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee has added it. So TRICARE before COVID was already covering telehealth for outpatient therapy services. So I think if we can get Congress to add PTOT SLPs as permanent telehealth providers, I think that's gonna help us with the other insurances maybe that are still hanging out there like the Aetna, like the Humana, and maybe other Blue Crosses that are in your respective states. That's awesome. So you already answered my next question. That was like, what were your opinion if you think that that's going to become like a rule uh, for Medicare to to cover the service too? So you it looked like you're an optimist on that. Uh, you know, I'm hoping uh, <laughs> you know, because you know, obviously Congress is going to say, well, this is just my opinion. Of course, I can't speak for Congress, but typically, what we see Congress do whenever. Uh, the APTA, AOTA, or ASHA want to, I guess, increase access to outpatient therapy, Congress will always says, well, that's going to increase the cost of the Medicare program. In my opinion, it, let's just say a Medicare beneficiary needs 10 visits to get better, okay? My opinion only is I think they're still going to take 10 visits, but maybe eight of them could be in person, maybe two via telehealth. Uh, my hope is that if telehealth is added permanently, PTs, OTs, SLPs are added permanently as telehealth providers. I hope we don't abuse the system. And, and in this example, if it would have taken 10 visits, now we do 13 because we still do the 10 in-person visits and then three via telehealth. Uh, my hope is it would be either all telehealth because I think some people where they reside, they're rural, they may have access to therapy. Uh, obviously, you know, we've got winter 
in some states where there's snow and ice and all of that, and people can't make therapy appointments for maybe two, three, four days. So instead of them coming for an in-person visit, could that be replaced by a telehealth visit? So I think that's the argument that sometimes Congress makes. It's going to be an increase to the cost in the system. And they might be right, but they also might be wrong. We just don't know. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, there are some insurances. I don't know if I'm correct on that, but I heard that they require a first evaluation in person, and then you would be able to do follow-ups with telehealth. I don't know if is that um, is still happening. Yeah, and you know, un unfortunately, there's as a consultant, I think the one thing people hate when they ask me a question is sometimes they answer yes, no, maybe so. It depends, because as I'm sure you and your followers know there's a lot of insurance companies and uh, we estimate it's about 6,000 insurance companies. Oh my so, God. You know, so we just, and we'll just speak on telehealth. So regarding telehealth, number one, you have to look at your state practice act. You know, does your state practice act allow you to do a telehealth visit? Let's just say the answer is yes. They, let's say you can do it. Well, does your state practice act require that you first do an in-person evaluation or does your practice act allow you to do that initial eval as a telehealth visit? So you have to know all of that. Well, then you got to go to the insurance company. Do they pay for telehealth? They do. Okay, do they pay for telehealth for the initial eval, the first visit? Or do they require an in-person visit first and then follow up? So you have to look at both of those and follow the one that's most stringent, most restrictive. Yeah, it makes sense. And any other changes that you uh, saw during this uh, pandemic in regards to the insurance and reimbursement? Well, in terms of the insurance reimbursement, really no. Uh, I think the vast majority of insurance, I mean, I'm not aware of any insurance company that paid telehealth at a lesser amount compared to an in-person visit. So I think, you know, the pandemic just opened up telehealth for PTs, OTs, SLPs. And I also think it let all these insurance companies collect valuable data on the use of telehealth. Uh, you know, one other, I think, positive change that came out of this right now is in the private practice setting, if, uh, if a Medicare beneficiary came to a private practice at PT or OT and they were going to be seen by an assistant, uh, Medicare rules required that the therapist that supervising that assistant be on the premise, direct supervision. Well, because of the pandemic, CMS has eased that definition of direct supervision, that they don't have to be on the premise right now. They can be available by two-way audiovisual communication. So think FaceTime, which really opens up that, you know, those mobile therapy clinics where now you could have an assistant go into a Medicare beneficiary's home, treat them as an outpatient. And that therapist doesn't have to be with them sitting on the couch watching Oprah and reruns of whatever, uh, you know, they just need to be available by two-way audiovisual communication. And, and that will stay in place until December 31st of the year in which the public health emergency is declared over. So for example, if the public health emergency is declared over say October 20th of 2021, that change in supervision is good until December 31 of 2021. But if the public health emergency is not declared over to say January 20th of 2022, those ease supervision requirements will stay in effect to December 31 of 2022. Again, even though CMS has eased the direct supervision definition, still gotta look at your state practice act. And if your state practice act requires direct supervision of the assistant and they have not eased that definition, then you still have to follow your state practice act. Yeah, there's a lot of variables there. There is. I mean, that's why, <laughs> you know, that's why it's not always an easy answer. And, and I think yeah. that's what makes it frustrating for people. It's not like two plus two is four all the time. It is so many things you have to look at and they change. So, and like another question in regards to what you just said about the Medicare, um, because they didn't cover it previously, the patients are able to pay cash for like a visit. Um, for telehealth, yes. For telehealth, right? So if um, now that it's covered, they can pay uh, private for pay cash for a visit while they are being covered through their insurance. Is that correct? 
That is correct. So right now, since the Medicare program is covering outpatient PT, OT, and SLP delivered via telehealth, uh, you, you then must be enrolled in the Medicare program and submit claims to your Medicare contractor. Uh, once this is declared over and assuming Congress does not add PTs, OTs, SLPs as eligible telehealth providers, then outpatient therapy delivered via telehealth goes back to being statutorily non-covered. And then you could see Medicare patients via telehealth and charge them cash. Okay, that's interesting. Right now I do telehealth and I don't, uh, I don't have any insurance. I'm out of network, so I can't see any Medicare patient. If they come to me, I have to refer them to another clinic that would cover the service. Correct. And, and just says, you know, because I get this question a lot because people go, well, Rick, when you say Medicare, does that mean Medicare Advantage too? No. So, you know, as you and I are talking the words Medicare today, that is traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage, completely different. Okay. Okay. I'm not super familiar with all this insurance. This thing is that I'm, I haven't been practicing for long here. So it's good to know. Um, and uh, do you think the uh, commercial insurance careers, do you think that they are going to keep reimbursing for telehealth? You kind of answered that question be before saying that you think yeah. they're going to go with the flow. Yeah, I mean, right now we, we know that uh, once the public health emergency is over, we know Cigna and United Healthcare have both said they're going to continue to pay for telehealth for those facilities that submit claims on a 1500 claim form. So, you know, that can be a private practice or a rehab agency typically will submit on a 1500 claim form to commercial payers. You know, both Cigna and United Healthcare in their policies once this public health emergency is declared over, uh, won't be paying for uh, telehealth if claims are submitted on a UB04 claim form. And in fact, some insurance companies have already stopped you know, paying for telehealth for facilities that bill on a UB04 claim form. And what will be this form? Yeah, so the, you know, the 1500 claim form is what a typically a private practice uses to submit claims to the insurance carrier. So if you're, you know, with Medicare, if you're set up as a private practice, you submit claims on a 1500. You know, if you're set up, say, as a hospital outpatient therapy department, a rehab agency, and you submit claims to Medicare, you submit on a UB as a boy, a UB04 claim form. So it's just different claim forms. Okay. Do you see uh, clients being able to be reimbursed after paying cash for a telehealth visit? By which insurance company? I don't know. Anyone, generally speaking? So you're Is saying, that possible? So you're so, saying the patient, the patient pays you cash for the telehealth visit. You give them like a, a bill. A super bill. Yeah, I mean, Medicare, the answer, of course, would be no. No. You know, yeah. Once the public health emergency is declared over, that's going to be a no. Uh, you know, with other commercial payers, this is going to be my opinion only, you know, if, if those other payers don't cover telehealth, if it's, you know, if it's not a covered benefit, then I think the answer is going to be no. Whereby if say you are not contracted, say with Cigna or United Healthcare, and you do a telehealth visit, say with a Cigna patient, they pay you whatever your fee is, you give them a bill, they then submit that to Cigna. Might Cigna pay, you know, might Cigna give that patient some money back because telehealth is covered by Cigna? The answer is it could be yes. Uh, unfortunately, I just can't give you a, a dead answer. It's always going to be yes, always going to be no. I think the yeah. important thing is to know, you know, for you and your followers that uh, to make sure your patients know that you tell them you're not contracted with, you know, their insurance company. I will give you a, a quote, a super bill, your insurance company may or may not pay you back. They may pay some of it back, none of it back, all of it back. You know, that's just up to you. And that, that patient needs to understand that. And because that's why they come to see you and they know you're not in network with their insurance. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'll jump on the bandwagon here, though, is Medicare Advantage, because I know there's many PTs, OTs, SLPs that are not uh, involved with the Medicare Advantage plans, and they just think, well, they can charge Medicare Advantage patients whatever they want. 
you know, believe it or not, you still have to call the Medicare Advantage plan and see if that Medicare Advantage beneficiary has out of network benefits. Now, if they don't have out of network benefits, and typically you see that with a Medicare Advantage HMO, typically they don't have out of network benefits. You can then charge that Medicare Advantage patient whatever you want. There's no limit on what you can collect. Whereby with many Medicare Advantage plans, many patients pick the, the PPO plans and those plans typically have out of network benefits. And if they then have out of network benefits, you're gonna be limited how much you can collect. And it's gonna be the summation of whatever the insurance pays and then whatever the insurance says the patient responsibility is. So for example, you may charge $200 for a telehealth visit, but if that Medicare Advantage patient has out of network benefits and the Medicare Advantage plan says, okay, you charge 200, we're gonna pay you 70, patient owes 35. That's all you can get is 105. You can't collect the difference, even though you're not enrolled with that Medicare Advantage plan. Oh, wow. that's crazy <laughs> it is that's why i don't have any hair left this is why i have to keep <laughs> learning all this stuff oh, what 30 years does to you you got 20 more to go <laughs> oh so many different rules oh god yeah it is yeah i mean it's it's there's a lot to know and, and obviously i think covid uh you know the last 15 16 months we probably saw the most changes in, in that 15 month period than we've seen ever in a 15 month period. Uh, not just because there were so, so many insurance companies that were just changing things on the fly and trying to keep up to date with all the major insurances. And of course they all had different requirements for telehealth. Uh, you know, some wanted this place of service code, others wanted this place of service code, others wanted this modifier, others wanted that modifier. They all had different time frames for, you know, when they were going to expire. It's been How nonstop. Did you keep up with all of that. Uh, I'll be honest. From from March of 2020 to about July of 2020, uh, kid you not, it was Monday through Sunday, usually 6 a.m. to about 11 p.m. midnight, keeping up and answering emails and writing and consulting and all that. Oh yeah, I bet. Was everybody going crazy? Yep. And everybody wants to start telehealth. You know, yeah. people, we can just start telehealth like this. Uh, but there's a lot to get ready for telehealth from a compliance standpoint. The, about between the major commercial insurances, where do you see it going? Do you think like they are mainly going to um, adhere to this telehealth uh, after the, the, the PHE is over? Yeah, I mean, my opinion, I, I think the ones that we've seen come out and say, I mean, I say the major ones, you look at, you know, the Aetna, the Cigna, United Healthcare, Humana, you know, those, uh, you know, we've seen Cigna come out already and United Healthcare come out already saying, you know, that they're going to cover telehealth in 2021 and beyond for those uh, settings that submit claims on a 1500 claim form. You've seen some blue classes do it, some other small payers do it, et cetera. You know, TRICARE was already covering telehealth prior to COVID. So you now I think we're just looking, you know, after the watch to see what Aetna does and, and the, the major blue classes around the country. And I think they're probably gonna wait and see what maybe the CMS does and what Congress does, is my opinion. Um, because my experience tells me that when Medicare makes changes, other payers tend to follow, especially when Medicare makes changes that will save payers money, uh, other payers definitely follow. So I think if we can get Congress to add PTs, OTs, SLPs as telehealth providers permanently, I think that gives us a, a great argument to move and puts pressure, I think, uh, on the Aetna's, on the Humana's and the ma other major Blue Crosses, things like that. And how can we help is there any petition, anything to sign? Yeah, I mean, I can, after this, you know, I can always get you some of the, 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 the bill numbers that are in the Senate, in the House, and really it's just having your listeners and your followers, you know, contact their U.S. representative, uh, contact their two senators asking for support on this legislation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how about workers' comp? Where do you see it going? Do you think it's because I know some they are covering telehealth, 
Yep. Do you see this uh, continuing after the, the pandemic? You know, this is my opinion only. You know, with workers' comp, I think once everything's, and in fact, we've seen a lot of workers' comp, you know, already stop telehealth, you know, even though the, the, even though, uh, the public health emergency is still in effect until July 20th. And again, people think it's going to get extended again for another 90 days after that. But I think a lot of the other insurance companies, whether it be private commercial or work comp, they're kind of settling down. And in my opinion, I don't see the majority of work comp carriers probably still going to continue to pay for telehealth. I just think they're a unique entity where they maybe want their patients in front of therapists and all that, especially if you have to do, say, work hardening, work conditioning, things like that. Yeah which it makes a little bit harder to do it through telehealth. Uh, it does. And is there a difference in the le legislation regarding the therapy's location while providing telehealth if the patients are self-pay versus billing insurance? Well, the legislation doesn't address both the self-pay. So, you know, obviously if Congress passes legislation adding permanently PTs, OTs, SLPs as telehealth providers, then tele outpatient therapy delivered via telehealth becomes a covered service, which then means if you want to see a Medicare beneficiary for outpatient therapy delivered via telehealth, you would have to enroll in the Medicare program. As, we, as you and I are talking right now on June 11th, 2021, uh, you know, there's also legislation that's been introduced in Congress that would allow physical therapists and OTs and SLPs to quote, opt out of Medicare, that they would not have to enroll in Medicare and patients could then choose to pay cash to those professionals. But again, right now, the way it stands that if a service is covered by the Medicare program, you as a PT, you as an OT, you as an SLP must enroll in the Medicare program if you want to treat Medicare patients for services covered by Medicare and submit claims to your Medicare administrative contractor. Okay. And in regards to the therapy's location, so for example, if uh, I'm licensed in Tennessee, the patient has to be in the state of Tennessee oh, I'm sorry, in yeah. order yeah, for me to see yeah. this patient. Yeah, so the way it has always been is you have to be licensed in the state the patient is in during the telehealth visit. So, for example, as you and I are talking right now, I am in California. Now, I'm not licensed in California, we're going to pretend I was. If I was licensed in California and there's a patient in California, I could do telehealth with that patient. Uh, now, I am licensed in the state of Michigan. So I could be sitting here in California. I can do a telehealth visit with a patient that's physically located in Michigan. And I, I could do that because I have a license in Michigan and I could submit that claim to that insurance company. But if I don't have a license in Michigan, I can't see that patient via telehealth. Now, obviously the PT compact becomes very important, but I'm sure as you know, and your listeners know, not every state is part of the PT compact yet. So, you know, PT compact is not that you get, quote, licensed in that other state, but you're given privileges to, to practice. So I do think another positive outcome, this is sad to say, of COVID is I, I really think it sped up the process of the PT compact around the states. I think it, I think it helped to get legislation passed quicker in some states and, and that, and some states are also still moving along and trying to get that passed in 2021. And it, there is no difference between the insurance and cash pay in regards to the therapy's location. I saw the question on your oh, website, oh, so that's why I'm pay. asking. I got, I yeah, got be, curious. Yeah, with, with, so if we have a, so say, uh, you know, I'm in, let's say I am now in Michigan, physically, as a, I'm sitting in Michigan, I'm a PT in Michigan, I'm licensed in Michigan. I want to now do a telehealth visit with a patient in California who wants to pay me cash. Well, 
I can't say I'm doing physical therapy because that patient is in California. In California, you got to get the Physical Therapy Practice Act. What are the requirements to say you're doing physical therapy and all that? Well, you have to be licensed and all that. So whether they're paying you cash or not, you still need to be licensed in that state if you're going to call it physical therapy. Yeah. Okay. And why should therapists be aware of should they practice telehealth in 2021 and beyond? Any things to remind our listeners that they, they should be careful and pay attention? Well, I mean, I, I you know, obviously I think there's there's therapists that were doing telehealth prior to COVID. So my hope is when if they were doing it back in 15, 16, 17, 18, my hope is they kind of know the rules and regulations. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people, a lot of therapists jumped into telehealth uh, at the end of March of 2020, April, May, June of 2020, and they did not understand maybe all the rules and regulations for telehealth. Maybe they don't understand all the consent forms that need to be signed, you know, things like that. So obviously I think what you need to be aware of either, either now and as you continue to go forward is, you know, what's required in terms of consent? You know, do you have policies and procedures in place? You know, right now, as you and I are doing this Zoom call, I can see you, you can see me. Well, I said, let's pretend this was a, a telehealth visit you're doing with me. But, well, what's your policy if Rick Grant does this and now Rick, dis I will disappear off your screen, but Rick disappears off your screen and you hear a thump and you're going, Rick, Rick, and I don't answer. What's your policy? What's your procedure for those emergencies, things like that? I also think because you know, there's still some insurance companies that are covering telehealth on a temporary basis during the public health emergency. So it's just making sure you know which insurances are still covering telehealth. When does when does it expire? Which ones are not? You know, they all they all have different requirements for place of service codes, modifiers, things like that. So I really think until the public health emergency emergency is declared over, there's still gonna be a lot of fluid changes with many insurance companies. And where do you advise the clinicians to look for all this information? Uh, that's a tough question to answer because uh, <laughs> there, there's just not one spot, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I think as a clinician, you know, you have to look at the different insurance companies' websites. Number one, you know, it's it's easy if you just say, well, "Rick, I just see Medicare. I just see Medicare at Cigna. Well, then you can kind of stay current with those. Maybe three websites, those three insurance companies. You know, obviously, I think your professional associations could be a great resource. Uh, your state associations website could be a great resource. You know, obviously, I'll plug me right now. Obviously, I have a lot of content on my website for my gold members that keep people up to date with the major insurance carriers like the Aetna's, Cigna's, Medicare, United Healthcare, and so on. I receive your newsletter, so I just see the highlights of everything that's going on. That's a good way, too, if you... You kind mm -hmm. of receive these updates, and then if you want to look deeper into, you just go there and find more information, right? Sure. Yep. I think I got all my questions. I know there are way more, but it's it's at least we are covering here the basic. Anything else that you want to add in regards to telehealth coverage? No, I think you pretty well uh, covered a lot of that. I, and I, I would just say, just kind of, you got to stay up to date on this stuff, especially with, with, with Medicare, because, you know, right now the public health emergency is due to expire at the end of the day on July 20th, 2021. We fully expect uh, CMS to, you know, add another 90 days on, which would get you roughly then to uh, what it's October 20th, 19th in there somewhere. Um, you know, a lot of experts, you know, and I say a lot of quote us experts say they'll probably do it to the end of the year. You know, my, my opinion, if they're going to go to December 31, I kind of hope they go to January 1, January 2, because uh, then that gets us that ease supervision requirements for the assistant for all of 2022 <laughs> would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and when do you think that the Congress, you're going to know the answer about the, the legislation, the Medicare legislation? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to go to the end of the year, in my opinion, because if Congress also has the same anticipation, so to speak, that the public health emergency will last at least until the end of 2021, then kind of they're under no pressure, really, 
to, yeah. to pass that legislation. Uh, and even if it does end, technically speaking, they're really under no pressure to pass it, assuming another public health emergency doesn't happen again. Uh, but again, my hope is if another public health emergency did happen again, uh, you know, the Secretary of Health and Human Services would issue the waiver quicker this time to allow PTs, OTs, SLPs to do telehealth because, you know, obviously the first public health emergency was declared in January of 2020. And the first waiver allowing PTs, OTs, SLPs to now be paid for telehealth did not occur to the end of April of 2020 for the private practice set for the private practice setting and then did not occur to you know near the end of May 2020 for all the other settings uh, whereby if we can get Congress to pass this legislation we don't need to worry about a waiver anymore we'd be included yeah yeah well awesome uh, so let's transition to our final questions what is your favorite resource of information yeah you know, I think you Whenever possible, you want to go to your major, you know, and I, I'll just start with Google and I'm not endorsing Google, but go to Google and just type in the words, for example, Aetna provider page, Cigna provider page, you know, uh, Humana provider page, whatever state, you know, Texas Blue Cross provider page, because that's really what you want to get to. You want to get to the provider page of an insurance company's website because that's where you're gonna be able to locate, you know, policies, procedures, maybe fee schedules, forms, things like that. Monthly newsletters, monthly bulletins, updates. And many of the big payers also have where you can sign up for automatic email notifications. So, you know, once a month, United Healthcare sends me an email. Michigan Blue Cross sends me an email. Aetna sends me emails. So I'm not always going on their website. It just comes to me. I can kind of scan the article, scan the publication. Is there anything about therapy? Yes, there is. Well, let me go read about it, see if it's something I need to get out to my members, things like that. And then, of course, if you just go to cms.gov, and, you know, obviously there's lots of manuals out there that are pertinent to physical occupational speech therapy. Awesome. Great tips. And uh, what would be the best advice you can give to physical therapists that are starting their careers? Yeah, and I think it depends where you start. You know, I think it depends if you're going to, you know, as you start your career, are you starting your own private practice right off the bat? Or are you going to go work for somebody, whether it's a private practice setting, hospital, etc.? Now, my first response is, I don't care where you go to work, number one, for this answer. You know, don't and I don't always quote believe what people always tell you because you know there, there's those myths out there that you can't double book Medicare patients or we've always done it this way and we've been okay. You know, if, if you're questioning yourself, you got that kind of uneasy feeling in your stomach. Go ahead and ask, and if you don't feel like you're getting the answers that you think are the answers, the correct answers, you know, try to find somebody that maybe knows more than you or contact your state association and ask and, and do that. Now, if you own your own private practice, I know it's a tough one for people to do because I know you don't have much money usually as you're coming out of school, back to public, no money when you come out of school and you start your private practice and all that. But I'm gonna be honest, it, it's way cheaper to pay a consultant for one to two to three hours of their time, whatever they charge, which may cost you a thousand dollars, but it's a thousand, but you'd rather do that up front than spend eight, nine, ten, twelve thousand dollars after the fact when you realize you did things wrong. Maybe you've been underbilling all this time, maybe you overbilled and now you got to pay an insurance company back, you know, things like that. And I know a lot of people try to learn things on Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, I've been on a lot of Facebook groups and, you know, I'll give free advice, answer questions. But if any of you, if you've ever seen any of my posts on Facebook, I say a lot of times you can't learn everything on Facebook. And keep in mind that people that answer your stuff on Facebook may or may not be right. You know, they may or may not be consultants and understand everything. So, I know it's tough to spend money when you don't have it or you're and all that, but you're better off doing it. I mean, me, I'm dangerous enough to probably fix stuff here at this house and the sink and stuff. But there are sometimes, you know what? 
better off to get the plumber in and pay him or her whatever I need to pay him or her. Uh, Cause if I try to do it and I mess it up, it could cost me a lot more money. Yeah. Better safe than sorry. Yep. And what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? I think number one, being humble, uh, you know, no, number two, not being afraid to ask questions and also admit that we don't know everything. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd love to be able to go back and change some things and, and how I acted and all that. And, uh, you know, people will say, boy, Rick, you present so well. And I say as humbly as I'm doing this, you present so well and all that. Well, that's because I've done, I've, I have done over a thousand presentations in, in, in that. It's just more fluid now. And you, you kind of, I kind of know how to, you know, handle the questions and, you know, quote, work the audience and all that. But if you were hearing me speak back in 06, 07, compared to 2019 or hopefully later in 2021, it, it'd be completely different. Uh, you know, I would say I don't consult on the clinical side, but I, the one thing I would say to therapists, because I know we all, and I did this as a consultant early on, you, you asked me a question, I know you want an answer, I would try to give you an answer. Even though that answer may not have been right or maybe not all, all the way right. So I think at times it's just okay as a new therapist, even an old therapist to say, you know, that's a great question. I'm not quite sure. Let me look it up and I'll get back to you. Or, or I'll, let me look it up tonight. When you come in tomorrow, we can go over it. And that can be true on a clinical side. It can be true on, on a business side and all of that. And then I would say, if you're going to start your own private practice, you know, hire good people that can compliment you. When I say compliment you, not say you're the best therapist ever. I mean, they're going to cover your weaknesses. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> Obviously, you're going to be strong in some things, you're going to be weak in some things. You want to hire other people that are strong in things that you're weak in, and maybe you, and where they're weak, you can help them and, and just get the right people around you to, to make it successful. Great. You, don't Thank always, you, so you don't always want yes people around you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Rick, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you are the specialist in the area, so uh, just leave your contact information. You have a great website, newsletter. Uh, you're always offering courses for people to get like updates. Mm -hmm. So just um, now, just use this time to to give us all the info. Sure. So my website is www.gowenda which is G-A-W-E-N-D-A, GowendaSeminars.com. You know, I have a lot of content out there on current news. I publish about two to four articles a week on the latest stories with Medicare, Aetna, Cigna, et cetera, from, you know, documentation, billing, coding, compliance, policy changes, telehealth updates, things like that. You know, I have a frequently asked questions section where I've got topics, say, on the ABN, on maintenance therapy, on Medicare Advantage plans, et cetera, where as a gold member, not only do you get all the, see the questions that I get asked on all those topics, you get the answers to all of those questions. So cost for that is $200 per year. So if you were to join today, it's good for one year. As you said, I also do a lot of webinars. So you can, you know, I have upcoming webinars, past webinars for sale. Uh, webinars are not included with gold membership. So gold membership is all the website content. Webinars are separately priced. And then of course I do consulting for any, anywhere from one person private practice to major hospitals that are in 17 different states. And I do provide consulting services and help answer questions that you may have on outpatient therapy services. And lastly, I hope you never need me in this, but I, I do serve as a legal expert uh, for therapists and attorneys that if you get into trouble with your state licensing board or insurance companies or God forbid, the Office of the Inspector General, uh, I, I do that as well. So hopefully you never need me for that one. Yeah, yeah, but good to know. And it's a great resources that you have. So I'm going to share all the links on the show notes so people can check it out. Yeah. Um, you can feel free to call me too. My phone number is 661-645-1490. So feel free to share that as well. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to put all of the information there. Thank and you. then um, the, the information about the, the legislation too, so we can try to help on the project on the Congress. Um, yes, uh, I will send just you, remind uh, everybody to, to do that. Absolutely. 
Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate, and I'm sure the listeners appreciate too, because that's a topic that it's a little complicated and it's uh, a pleasure to have a specialist here. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me.